Okay, this morning we're going to look at 1 Kings, chapter 6. And we're going to look at the building of Solomon's temple. We talked a lot about the tabernacle, and we talked a lot about Herod's temple. But I didn't think we had talked too much about Solomon's temple, and of course there's a Zerubbabel's temple too. So we're going to look at, you know, this uh, chapter 6. And you have to remember that chapter 6 is going to come in the 480th year after they came out of Egypt. Okay, so it's 480 years have passed. Um, in the month of Zev, which would be the month of IR, this would be April, May. So it's this time period we're in right now. It's from this, you know, they're going to look at the Dorm and Solomon's Temple. So 1 Kings chapter 6. In the 400 year and 80th year, of Israel left the land of Egypt in the Mount of Zed, and that is the second month in the fourth year of his reign over Israel, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. The house which King Solomon built for the Lord was cubic, uh, 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. The portico in the front of the great hall of the house was 20 cubits long along with the width of the house, and 10 cubits deep to the front of the house. He made windows for the house, recessed and latticed, and against the outside of the house, the outside walls of the house, enclosing the great hall and shrine. He built a storied structure, and he made side chambers all around. The lower story was five cubits wide, and the middle one was six cubits wide, and the third seven cubits wide, for he had provided recess around the outside of the house so as not to penetrate the walls of the house. When a house was built, only finished stones cut the quarry were used so that no hammer or axe or any arm tool was heard in the house while it was being built. The entrance to the middle story of the side chamber was on the right side of the house, and winding stairs led up to the middle chamber from the middle chamber to the third story. When he finished building the house, he paneled the house with beams and planks of cedar. He built the story structures against the entire house, each story five cubits high, so that encased the house with timbers of cedar. Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon with regards to this house you are building. If you follow my laws and observe my rules and faithfully keep my commandments, I will fulfill for you the promise that I have given to your father David. I will abide among the children of Israel and will never forsake my people Israel. When Solomon had completed the construction of the house, he paneled the walls of the house on the inside with planks of cedar, also overlaid them on the inside with wood, and from the floor of the house to the ceiling, he overlaid the floor of the house with planks of cypress. Twenty cubits from the rear of the house, he built a partition of plank, cedar planks from the floor to the walls. He furnished the interior to serve as a shrine as the Holy of Holies. The front part of the house, that is the great hall, measured forty cubits. The cedar of uh, the interior of the house had gardens of gourds and claxes. It was all cedar, no stone was exposed. So anyway, if we stop and look at this, we're going to see, compared to the tabernacle in the wilderness, this is going to be, number one, it's going to be a stationary structure, number two, it's going to be larger because it's stationary. Okay. Um, it's going to have the similar designs, you know, as, you know, as the tabernacle and as, as um, the other one, uh, you know, the tabernacle and Herod's temple, they're all going to fall in sort of the same time bracket. You see the measurements are given in cubics. A cubic, remember, is measured from the tip of your finger to your elbow. So you're roughly looking at, what, 25 inches or so? So if you take that, if, you, if it gives us a, approximately 100 feet long, 33 feet long, and 50 feet high. So that gives you some, about some idea how big this uh, Solomon's temple would be. The main temple building would be 3,675 square feet rectangular in shape. Some houses are about that size today. Mm -hmm. So you can tell it's not, it's not massive. It's not like it's taken up 50 acres of land. So, um, it, so if you compare that to the tabernacle, you're looking at something that's going to be twice the size of what the tabernacle was. You know, when it was laid out. Um, Again, stationary compared to not being stationary. Tent was a little over 18, 1,800, I think, square feet. So the tabernacle in uh, Exodus says it was 30 by 10 cubics. Solomon's temple is going to be 60 by 20 cubics, so it's, it's like double 
Holy of Holies in the tabernacle was 10 by 10. Solomon's going to be then 20 by 20. And the same thing, the outer room, Solomon's, uh, or the tabernacle was 20 by 10. So Solomon's temple would be 40 by 20. So, um, so we're finding that in that, you know, in 1 Kings chapter 6, um, that the structure they're building, they're calling it the house of the Lord. And you see that all throughout that reading where it came to the Lord, the house, the house, the house. You see that, you know, his phrase that he used in there throughout that whole thing. Um, and in Hebrew, it's called Bet. Bet in Hebrew is house. Okay, like Bethlehem, house of bread. Um, Bet Yehovah. So Isaiah 66, 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where could you build a house for me? What place could serve as my abode? So, you can see that, you know, this is going to be symbolic of the throne in heaven. You're going to see that going throughout Scripture. It's going to go into Revelations that way because His home is in heaven. So, this thing would be built for the sake of the Israelites. They would have to be taught the ways of God. You know, how you can approach a holy God. You know, so, uh, 1 Kings 8.27 says, if you flip over to that, but will God really dwell on earth? Even the heavens to their uttermost reaches cannot contain you. Oh, how much less this house, again, talking about Solomon's temple, that I have built. Yet turn, O Lord my God, to the prayers and supplications of your servant, and hear the cry and prayers which your servants offer before you this day. May your eyes be open day and night toward this house, toward the place which you have said, My name shall abide there. May you heed the prayers which your servant will offer toward this place. And when you hear the supplications which your servant and your people Israel offer toward this place, give heed in your heavenly abode, give heed and pardon. And so here, you know, God's asking, but will God really dwell on earth? Even the heavens and the utmost reaches cannot be. So symbolically, he dwells on earth. We find the prayers should be directed toward the temple. You know, and that's what this 829 is saying. Solomon's life was anything but perfect. He had given, you know, he had God given <coughs> wisdom, he had riches, he had splendor, but yet he had a lot of wives and concubines. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and then Jeremiah is going to come along in Jeremiah 26, 13 and say, Jeremiah said to the officials and to all the people, it was the Lord who sent me to prophesy against this house. So when Jeremiah again is talking about this house, he is talking about Solomon's temple. Okay. And he says, uh, against this house and this city and all the words you heed. He says, therefore, mend your ways. He's telling them to mend their ways and the acts. And he, the Lord your God, that the Lord may renounce the punishment he has decreed for you. Which tells me, <coughs> right then, that they are going to do stuff they're not supposed to be doing. And God's not going to be happy because you got Jeremiah prophets prophesying this to them. And so he spoke, just like prophets speak today, true prophets speak today, just like things that are happening. But did the people listen? No. They didn't listen then. They don't listen today. You know, nobody listens, and history eventually repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sign Lamentations talked about. So the people were doing their own thing. It would be in disobedient. And so what happens, you know, they were worshiping idols, and they were mistreating one another. They come to the point, well, you know, we'll just mistreat them, and, and what else? You know, we'll just, nothing's going to happen. Well, it does happen. In First Chronicles 22, we find David's going to prepare to build this house for God, for the Lord. It would be built on Mount Moriah, <coughs> which is where the Temple Mount is now. You know, where the big gold dome is, it's there. Um, it would be the same place that Abraham would offer up Isaac. And Jewish tradition says that's where Adam and Eve were formed and created, all on that Temple Mount area. You know, it's where Herod's Temple was going to stand, too. So even though David could not build the temple because David's going to be a man of war and a man of blood, God says, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. So it's going to be passed through him to his son. That's how Solomon comes into the picture. You know, um, the cost to build the structure has been estimated to have cost of 31 
billion dollars together. Wow. Can't imagine what it would cost today. Thirty-one billion is what they're estimating. It would be his, um, you know, David's son Solomon. You know that would build it, uh, and it stood four hundred and ten years. Yeah, you know, I look at some of this stuff and I think, oh, it stood for a long, long time, or it didn't stand long at all. Herod's temple wasn't long at all. I, I don't think it was even completed when it was. You know, yeah. Not completed. They were still working on it, you know, when it was destroyed in 70 AD. But this one stands 410 years. I, I can imagine the people, if it's standing that long, you've got <laughs> generations upon generations that are dying off. So consequently, as those generations died off, if their parents had not talked to them about the temple, about the prophecies, about Jeremiah, they would have no clue, you know, what was going on. So 410 years this thing stood. People must have been happy as a little peach pie. They were doing their own thing. Everything was going on great, according to them. But seven years to complete this structure. It wasn't an overnight quick fix. Um, seven years to complete and dedicated in 827 BCE. And that would be about 2,434 years ago. <laughs> Who's counting? So to build this temple, he's going to require many different people to build it. You know, just like, you know, building a house today, you have to have many different people building the house. You've got to have an electrician come in, you got to have permits. Same thing with building this temple. And they're going to have to get trees from Lebanon, that's why they're called Lebanon. Trees that we read, you know, to bring them in, to cut them down. Stones are going to be cut from nearby quarries, but as we read, you're not going to have the ch sound of chisels and axe and everything. They're going to be cut in the quarries and then transported in. Herod's going to do the same thing. So, you know, you've got all these people coming in, craftsmen, as well as expensive materials. They even had stuff coming in for the house of the Lord on boats. You know, that's going to be, you know, for the hangings and everything. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a lavish place for its time period. But it never compared to Herod's. Herod's was supposed to be, the, you know, would have been one of the seven wonders of the world if it was still standing today. And you know, and then the big debate has been, you know, the the past few years is did Solomon's temple really stand there? And of course, the Muslims have been constantly coming in and tearing stuff off of the Temple Mount and knocking it down. And you know, they've they've traced back logs now or beams that were in Herod's temple, and just last week or week before. They have found, gone all the way down and have found beams now from Solomon's temple. So whoever is saying, you know, oh, the temple wasn't here, it was down further. I mean, when you start doing research, you know, on the Temple Mount area, you get everybody's opinion, you know, saying, no, the temple was, wasn't up where the dome is. It was down closer to, to the mosque, to the other mosque that's there. And you know where I'm talking about because you've mm -hmm. been there. You know, you get all, and you, some people say, no, it was down in the city of David, which is way down at the other end. And now that they're starting to find all this stuff, you know, because the Muslims are just des desecrating everything on the on the Temple Mount, they're 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 finding they found steps that were going up to Solomon's Temple. So yes, the Temple did stand there. That's exactly where it standed. So you can't take um, artifacts and history away. You know, it, it it was there, and that's where it is. So for seven long years, they're going to labor to build this house for the Lord. And after seven years, Solomon says, okay, we're going to delegate, delegate, dedicate the temple and all of its contents. And so he did. And so the ark was present in Solomon's temple, but not Herod's. By that time, it was gone. It had been captured, and they did not have it. So here they have the ark. You know, the people are excited. They're going to celebrate for seven days. They're going to do everything that they did in the tabernacle. They're going to do it in Solomon's temple as far as sacrificing. Even into Herod's temple, they're going to do the same thing, even though it's minus the ark. It was just the, the they would go in, according to the uh, Temple Mount people, and the rock that's there that that thing is on, they would go in and do all the dedication, just like the ark was there, but the ark was never there, never sat there. Um, so eventually there would be a power struggle is going to come along, and this power struggle is going to be between the Assyrians, it's going to be between the Egyptians, and it's going to be between the Babylonians. And guess what? When you look at that and, and surround it, you know, look where Egypt stands and where each one stands, that puts the, the, the kingdom of Judah, which is, you know, now um, Jerusalem, right smack dab in the center. So with them being in the center, what's going to happen? They're going to have to decide, okay, one of these people we're going to have to side with, and who are we going to side with? 
And so you had to pick from one of these people and they're going to say, okay, we're going to form an alliance with these people because they will help us in this power struggle and they will protect us. Totally forgetting, again, Jeremiah had prophesied in what he had prophesied, you know, that this eventually is going to come. So who do they pick? Egypt. Why is there constant conflict now with Egypt? That's where this goes back. See, this isn't just that everybody thinks, oh, it's a new thing that we're fighting with Egypt now. This has gone back all the way, you know, to you know, the Old Testament. And so they pick Egypt, you know, and they side with, you know, they side with him. Well, you know, who comes in with it? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? And it's at this time he left Jerusalem in shambles. He took 10,000 Jews to Babylon where they would go into captivity. But when he took those people, he did not take the low class and the, he took all the skilled workers. That's, who he took. That's how Daniel ends up in there. You know, he took all the skilled workers, all the people that has some worth or value. He didn't take somebody that was just a housewife and just cleaned and cooked. Now he took, you know, your skilled workers. Um, and, you know, he left no skilled people basically in Jerusalem. And that would prove no better because Nebuchadnezzar would appoint, you know, as he leaves, he's going to appoint another guy by the name of Zedekiah. He says, okay, I'm leaving, you're in charge. And so he gives Zedekiah everything to be in charge for this thing, you know, so he, you know, he would do what he was supposed to do. Well, Zedekiah was no better than anybody else, and, you know, he, all he wanted to do was break free of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want him to break free, so that reforced Nebuchadnezzar to return to Jerusalem, and he's going to seize Jerusalem at that point. So it was a long war. It took 30 months. 30 months. And during that time period, the walls of the city were breached. The people were left, uh, and they were faced. <coughs> they were faced with hunger. When war comes in, that's what it does. It does hunger, and it does what else? It spreads disease. Ep epidemics come in. And so now you've got you know Jerusalem in shambles. You've got people hungry. You've got epidemics breaking out. And the city eventually is going to be destroyed, and it's going to be set on fire. It would be on the 9th of Av that the temple was set on fire. That's why the Jews mourn to this day, the 9th of Av. You know, it's, um, it's, you know, I'll read you through history what has happened on that day. In fact, during, during that, you know, the day, the 9th of Av, which is usually falls around August 3rd or 4th, somewhere along that time period, um, they read the Book of Lamentations because that's what Lamentations is talking about, the, 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 the destruction of the temple in the morning and, you know, how they miss everything. And so, you know, all the gold that remained went back to Babylon. You know, thousands were killed, and they were trying to escape. They were taken prisoners and taken to Babylon. So you've got everything in just total shambles. Thus, the end of Solomon's reign, uh, the city of Jerusalem and the Holy Temple, uh, Jeremiah had spoken, had come to pass. So, but Jeremiah also said that the people would return and build the temple, and 70 years later they did just that. So on the 9th of Av has always been a bad day for Israel, with the loss of Solomon's and Herod's temple. And not only that time period, they've looked in years uh, past, and they found out that uh, the first crusade under Pope Urban II, 10,000 Jews were killed you know, during the first month of the crusade, the first month. The expulsion of Jews from England comes along and happens as if that's it, out. Then you wonder why so many people can trace their lineage back to Lin England because they came during that time period that they were expelled from England. That's how they get here. Second thing, in 1492, the Inquisition of Spain in Spain and Portugal results and says, that's it, goodbye Jews, and they kick them out. So if you've got any lineage that goes to England and Spain, somehow along the line you might interweave with this Jewish thing. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, in uh, 1492 you got the concentration camps coming in. Mm -hmm. um, you got World War One and Two, you know, that takes place. World War One or World War Two was really just an extension of World War One. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's what's going to happen there. And, and you think that, well, that's, you know, that's a long time ago, you know, we're in 2014. You know, but as late as 1989, Iraq walks out on the talks with Kuwait. That made a big thing. This is all on the 9th of Av now. 
And in 1994, the Bymans of the AMIA, uh, I think it is, it's a Jewish community center, but it's in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. And they killed 86 people and wounded over 300. This all happens on this day. And so bad things happen on that day. Well, when I went back and started looking, because this coming month, April, which we're, what, two days away from April, Larry had preached on this, what, a couple of months ago? About the blood moons? Oh, yeah. So this year we have the lunar eclipses, have the blood moons to occur, you know, this year and next year. Mm -hmm. And Acts 2.20 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moons into blood, before the great and noble, notable day of the Lord comes. So to date, there has been seven back-to-back blood red moons with the eighth coming this year eight is symbolic of new beginnings and they're going to happen on passover which is coming up very soon mm -hmm. and sukkot in 2014 as well as next year in 2015. mark blitz an, another you know jewish uh, rabbi has traced this back to seven times since 1 a.d three are connected to the 1942 final years of the Spanish Inquisition. In 1948, uh, it goes back to Israel's war with independence and 1967 to the Six-Day War. All the blood runes have proven bad for Israel. So that's why they're really looking at these blood red moons and seeing what they're going to do. Um, they, they, ha they get the dates down on, let's see, and the Spanish Inquisition in, 19, in 1492, Passover, April the 2nd, 1493, and Sukkot, September the 25th, 1493. These are all when the blood moons occurred. And then again in, 19, in 1494 for Passover and Sukkot. When the War of Independence took place in 1948, it was the same thing. Passover, April 13th, 1949, and Sukkot. And again in 1950, April the 2nd and September 26th. Six day war comes along, same thing, Passover and Sukkot. So when will it occur in the 2013-14 time period? Well, the first Passover this year will be April the 15th. Sukkot this year will be October the 8th. And then next year, Passover is gonna be April the 4th and Sukkot will be September the 28th. Fall Feast in 2015, which is next year, Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, will be September the 14th. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, September the 23rd. And Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, is September the 28th. So he goes on to say, during this uh, year, February 21st, blood red moon, Israeli Defense uh, Minister Yuhar Barak, the IDF Chief of Staff, spoke in preparation of the war with Hezbollah and Hamas. So, you know, they're talking about the blood red moons. Um, that it said on the Temple Mount, Passover is the first annual feast that comes into play in the Jewish calendar. Sukkot is the seventh, you know, and final annual feast of the year. And Av is that month that the Jews mourn from the 17th of Tammuz to the 8th, 9th of Av. It's a 21 day mourning period. We have 21 day fast, they go to 21 days of mourning, you know, for, you know, for all that stuff that's happened to them, because something always significant happens there. Uh, that's when World War II breaks out, World War I and II, you're going to trace that back to there. Um, and so now they're saying, you know, this Mark Bliss is saying that during this century, the only string of four consecutive blood moons that coincide with God's holy days of Passover in the spring and autumn feast of tabernacles were occur in 2014 and 15 on the Cordarian calendar. So there was no astronomical back-to-back -back blood red moons events in the 1800s or 1700s or 1600s. In the 1500s there were six, but none of those fell on Passover and Sukkot. The 2014-15 would be the last of this century. Not as significant in that part. Um, total eclipses for the month of Av on the 1st of Av in 2008, 9, and 10, there will be total eclipses. NASA has said the total eclipses will occur uh, August the 8th, August the 1st, 2008, 22nd, 2009, and July 2010. That's Av. So, um, in the month of uh, Av, disaster and consolation, so 
Also during that time period, there's a lot of stuff that took place in Jewish history. Aaron is going to die on the first of Av. You know, first day of the year. He's 122 years old when he died. He was three years older than Moses. So he's going to die. So that 21 day of, of, of mourning is going to come into being. So things are heating up for this year coming up. As I said, sun sundown on uh, July 15th, sundown on August the 4th, you know, and the blood moons are, you know, are going to take place. So I guess we will see what will happen with this and how this is all going to tie in to, you know, what history has in store for us. Interesting times. Interesting times. Huh? I say that's in Revelations. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows really exactly what's going to happen and how this is going to play out. But prophets of old foresaw stuff, so I'm sure they foresaw what this stuff is going to come to be. Mm -hmm. Before we uh, call the kids back down here.